We're sitting here talking to Jenny Coe. Jenny, it's fantastic that you're coming to Iris for the first time and playing this piece that I've known for a long time. You know, my dad uh, premiered it in 1954. I do know that. Um, it's a piece I've loved for a long time, and I would say it could be Bernstein's best symphonic work. I actually, I, I think it's it's aged incredibly well. Somebody reminded me that your dad premiered it. Um, and of course, that made me a little more nervous for this concert. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you play it many times. You play it incredibly beautifully, and uh, with a real connection to it. It is it really. It sounds even you know, fifty, sixty years later. It sounds so new and so American and so optimistic and so beautiful. The fourth movement is really one of the, some of the most beautiful music he ever wrote. I think it. It's, it. It kind of reminds me of of have a great dinner party, and and by the last movement, people have had a lot of wonderful wine to drink, and um, they've been having these intense conversations and it's just a great party um, and, 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 and there's kind of a beautiful line to the piece as well because um, you really have all these different dialogues um, of course coming from the symposium right yeah which no, is no. also late or, or is which is also quite uh, light I think in a way as a work by Plato everybody thinks Plato is going to be really heavy but it's actually quite short and light um, and, and that too is like a dinner party well, sure, and there's a lot of talk in that in the symposiums about love, mm -hmm. so it's a very emotionally direct piece, I think, um, and it is a lot of fun, and it's 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 an incredibly interesting thing to do it. I mean, I've, I've done it in other contexts with groups slightly larger than Iris. There's something very intimate about hearing all the parts. The only thing is you have to worry about balancing the percussion a little bit because the percussion's writing is kind of intricate and there's a lot going on. But um, it's, it's, it lines up so well, you know? It's so well written. It's really, yeah. well, it's a pleasure. Um, it's also great that you could come to Iris and do all of the outreach stuff that you did and the master class and uh, the, kids at Sol the Soulsville and Stacks. It, it's really inspiring. Is it, when did that start to be so much part of your mission? Because as a musician, you're defining yourself in your career as somebody who's really fearless in all of these areas, you know? You're playing recitals with Bach, but you mix it with music that was written 20 minutes ago. <laughs> and you play in a lot of big venues, and you play at Carnegie Hall, but you're playing in all of these really interesting places. You have no problem going out to schools and, and doing a lot of community outreach. That was a conscious decision, wasn't it? Well, I feel like music is really for everyone. I, you know, in the sense that when I, when I think about how lucky I was that my parents happened to start me in music, um, and how much it's changed my life and how much I can't imagine what my life would be like without it. Um, it seems tragic to me that, that children wouldn't have that kind of exposure at a young age, um, that they wouldn't at least have that opportunity to hear music in that way um, and in an intimate setting. Um, so that's always been a very important part to me. I, I mean, aside from the fact that um, there, there's not a, a national platform for arts in the United States, which I find problematic. Um, but I do, you know, I believe in sharing that music is a shared experience, that it's a very visceral experience, that it's a very human experience. Um, and so, therefore, in a sense, the, the setting doesn't matter, that it's always about communication. So whether you're in a classroom, whether you're in Carnegie, whether you're here in Germantown, it, it's about uniting people as a whole. It's about united humanity. It's about going back to that very um, primal part of who we are. And you seem to be able to do it with music that was written a long time ago and music that was written um, very recently. Do you think that that's the way to make the case? Because I do. I think the way to make the case for the music of our time is to show how relevant it can be and also in the context of all the music that we supposedly know so well. Yeah. Which, in fact, a lot of people say they do, but they don't. I mean, you're playing... Um, in a lot of places, you're playing, um, whether on the same recital or in consecutive concerts, the six sonatas and partitas of Bach, for instance. And people, you know, a lot of people know the Chacon, and a lot of people, you know, will know the beginning of the E major uh, partita. But then, when you get down to it, how many people really know the fugue of the A minor? How many people really can hum the fugue of the C major? And yet, you're showing how immediate and, rele and relevant. I don't mean for us musicians, but I mean for the general public, um, how immediately compelling that music is when you hear it. And then in that context, you play a piece by, whether it's Isai or, or John Adams, and all of a sudden the music comes alive. Well, I think, I mean, for me, you know, we live in a, in a modern context, so, so we obviously listen 
Bach was around 300 some years ago. And so the way we listen to his music is not the way that a person during Bach's time would be listening to his music. And yet it's still relevant 325 years later. So in a sense, sometimes, a lot of times I find it interesting to pair older music with, with contemporary music because contemporary music is really um, uh, the culture of our time. Um, and I think that the, you know, oftentimes um, it shapes the way that we hear and, and play and listen um, to music that was older. Right. Um, and, and both actually informs the other because you can, because basically every day that passes we're, we're a day further from the time of Bach, from the time of Beethoven. And you know, what really creates that umbilical cord, I feel like, to the present is composition because um, there's no composer, there's, the composers that I choose to play do know who Bach is and do know his music and have studied Bach. And you can hear that influence in their music. Um, and so it, it creates really this, this beautiful thread to the past and, and it creates a kind of um, immediacy um, and, and relevancy to, I think, to a contemporary culture that hasn't been steeped in that tradition. So I think, um, for me, that's really important in terms of, of programming. Well, that's interesting. Um, before we go, you should talk a little bit about your fiddle, because it sounds so good. Okay. Um, you're playing on a beautiful strat. Yes, I've been very lucky to um, be playing and performing on, on the 1727 Ex um General DuPont Stradivarius. Wow. Um, and but do you own it? or? It's been on loan to me for the last 13 years. And that means... And then we'll see. You'll see. <laughs> Are you trying to figure out a way to buy it? We'll see. I can't actually talk about it oh. publicly because it's, um, it, it's because it's a legal matter. So. Oh, it's a legal matter. Well, you certainly sound great on the fiddle. And, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the fiddle should be lucky that it has you playing. Thank you. Thanks for Thank coming you. to Iris. Thank you, Michael.